Hey, everyone, and welcome back to The Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm here with Lindsay, and uh, this week she's having the internet problem, so we'll see if she can stay with us. So I, I pass them over to her, which is it's okay, I guess, for once. So, And uh, we have a good one here for you today. We are with author, editor, and podcaster Allie Bishop. Allie, welcome to the show. Thank you. And we'll just get started kind of where you got started in all this. Um, so first question what came first, the, the podcast or the egg, or the podcast or the writing? <laughs> <laughs> well, the writing came first. I've been writing since I was eight, which is kind of, I think, the story of most writers. And uh, I've been plucking away at my craft for a really long time in secret, kind of hiding everything in the bottom drawers of desks, and uh, only recently actually had something published. Awesome. We'll get to that in a second for sure and what you're doing with that. So I'm curious, though, um, so... With your podcast, I know you do a lot of uh, author help and marketing advice, consulting, things like that. So how did you get started in that line of work? You know, I have listened to podcasts probably since podcasts became a thing on iTunes. And I, I don't even remember what the first podcast was I listened to. I just loved this idea of radio that didn't have commercials. <laughs> and so that kind of got me started. So I was listening to just any kind of podcast I could get my hands on. And uh, I fell in love with some of WNYC's podcasts that they sponsor. And to this day, one of my favorites is Freakonomics. And I just thought, you know, I should try my hand at this. This is really easy. <laughs> oh, I laugh. And so I just, you know, I've actually done a couple of podcasts. I think I've done four total. But um, the one that's had the most staying power and the one I've stuck with has been the writing-focused podcast, which is Upgrade Your Story. And you do editing and formatting work, too. Were you doing that before the podcast, or did that come on from the podcast? The, I've, been, I've been a professional editor for about... Um, I've been editing for eight years, but I've been professionally a paid editor for three years. Um, but I, it was around the time I decided to start my company, and I thought, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> at, at the time, there weren't a lot of writing podcasts. Now, there's a lot more than there used to be, and we've definitely seen more spring up even in the last six months. Um, but at the time, there just wasn't a lot out there. There was a couple of them, but they were either very literary focused, which is perfectly fine, but I wanted to have something that focused more on craft and that looked at kind of the, the debates that happen within the publishing world because there's, you know, with indie publishing and the kind of onslaught of small publishers, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot that changes on, you know, a day-to-day, month-to-month basis, and those are the conversations I wanted to have. And since I couldn't find anyone having the conversations I wanted to have, I thought, well, I'll have them myself. So I started a podcast. Well, that's that's how a lot of uh, best things start. So you know, make if you find like a well, it's like products. You know, I, I have this on the brain because I was just watching the Shark Tank thing where they're like, <laughs> you know, I have a problem, and I fix it myself, and I sell that to other people. But um, anyway, so the the podcast, you're right, a lot of them it seems like are 100% marketing or what's going on, so there's not that many um, that do the, do craft or try to straddle both, which I think we, we're trying to do, but we, we kind of get off on the marketing side quite a bit too, which is fine. But uh, So with the with the podcast, is, is yours completely about the craft of writing, you know, how, and editing and things like that, or what all do you cover in your, your show? Well, it kind of depends on what people want to talk about. When I started, um, I interviewed authors because I had access to them because I'm an editor, so I could just throw out a request and I had probably 50 authors sign up. And after a while, I was like, you know, these not that the authors weren't interesting, but you can only ask the same questions over and over again. There's only so many interview questions you can ask. And I found the most interesting podcast for where we actually got into either talking about craft or talking about publishing. And I did a a couple of interviews last year as an editor and (laughs) the questions people sent me were all marketing related. (laughs) So I mean really, what can you ask about editing? You either have the skill set or you don't. And not all of us can edit, not all of us can write. You know, we all have our different strengths and so everyone just kept talking about marketing. So my, my focus for 2015 thus far has been really kind of focusing more on marketing but also the craft issues that get us caught, the things that either stop us from being successful, stop us from getting the good reviews. I always say your editor is the person that stands between you and the bad review. And it's not that you won't ever get a bad review if you use an editor, but certainly you definitely cut down on that chance. And so I've been really focused on on those elements. So anyone that comes on the podcast, you really have to have something to talk about. You can't just come on and, and interview because you've written something because there's a lot of writers out there and there's there's places for that. But I really do want to talk about the craft elements that get us hung up. And then obviously about the marketing piece too, because I think that's where a lot of new authors really struggle. 
Sure. And so on the editing side of things for a minute, uh, since you've been editing, I think you said eight years now, is that all been uh, indie indie work or self-published work? or? No, I actually ran for years. I ran critique groups. Um, I When I was going to school, I have um, a Master's of Fine Arts in, in Creative Writing, and I lived in a small town. There wasn't a lot. I didn't think there were a lot of people that wrote, so I threw up. Um, Meetup.com was in its infancy, and so I threw up a request for a critique group. I was like, does anybody want to sit around and critique? And I had no idea the kind of response I was going to get. So for many years, I ran critique groups. I ran workshops. I taught people about the craft of writing, and it just kind of was what fit, because I've always been a teacher. And then later on, it just became people started asking, well, what could I pay you for this? And I was like, oh, Hmm. I never thought about charging someone for this, and so I just—that's kind of how I—I fa- I kind of backed my way into it, and I've just been doing it ever since. Awesome, man. Yeah, that, that's uh, it's always always nice when you're giving out free advice, and then people want to pay you for it. So it <laughs> they're like, you're really good at this. <laughs> and so with uh, with editing, you said one of the things you really like to go over on your show is what is hanging people up from getting a good story out. So to dip into editing for a little bit of the show. Uh, what have you noticed, especially with self-published authors, are really common things that it seems like a lot of people just just don't get? Oh, the advice I give on almost, I shouldn't say every edit because that's not true, but on, on 80% of the edits that I do, particularly if they're not my regular clients, so re- my regular clients know better now, but if you're not my regular client, you're a new client or you're with a publisher and, I'm, and I have a couple of publishers I, I edit for, uh, they don't outline. Outlining really... Um, it it changes the ball game. You it, and and the sad thing is, is people think that outlining stops them from being creative. They think that it boxes them in. And a good outline should actually do the exact opposite. It should give you the freedom to really explore your story. Because when you know what's coming next, when you know the next beat you need to get to, and you understand that function, it gives you all the freedom in the world to go explore that other turn in the road, um, because you know where you're going to end up. But when you don't have that and you go down and explore that turn of the road and it doesn't turn out the way you think it's going to be, then your story's all over the place. And it's a rare month that I don't give that advice to at least two authors um, that I've worked with because it's just, it's one of the biggest mistakes that independent authors make, not even just new authors. I've seen a lot of seasoned authors make that mistake. They're switching genres, they're trying something new, and they didn't outline it because, well, I never had to outline my other ones, I just know how they work. Well... That's fine. Maybe you memorized that tri- those tropes and that, that the way that genre works, and you can get away with it. But when you move into a different genre, now you got to get back in there. You got to figure out how it works, and outlining really helps you do that. So that's usually my top advice. <laughs> it's funny too, because we that's a uh, that's a really big topic here recently. We're actually working on getting someone on the show next week. That the whole show is basically going to be a lot. Well, not the whole show, but a lot of it will be about outlining and things. So. Um, it, it seems like a, a really hot topic at the moment. So you said that you can tell right off that they haven't outlined because it's all over the place. Do you find that it's that they're running into to like pitfalls or it's just meandering and you know, not getting to a point? Or Usually it's lack of tension. So particularly in genre fiction, you have to have consistent tension throughout the story. And it doesn't matter whether it's a romance, if it's horror, if it's fantasy, if it's... You, it really doesn't matter what, which genre it is. If it's commercial genre fiction, people expect tension because tension is what gets them to turn the page. And so what I find consistently is that people miss the boat and they lose it. Or what I've, I've seen other authors do sometimes is they'll have too much story and they'll try to pile it all in. So then you have fragmented storylines. So you had these people mentioned, but you never came back to them again. Or you had this issue happen, but you never closed that story arc. And those sorts of things, when you... I actually just taught an outlining course because I do a visual outline. Um, and it's free on my website. Anybody can go download it. But I literally just used a, a mind mapping program and created a visual outline. And you can go and you can download it. And you literally just plot out your story. It's the easiest thing ever. I just outlined a whole story in less than two hours, um, including all my 3 by 5 cards and all my notes. Um, and it, it helps you see that if I know that this is the end of my first act, then I have to get to this point of tension by this point. And if you're not doing that, then you have to go back and rework the story. And it saves you all that time of having, I mean, let's face it, we all love to sit down with a new story idea and, and play. I mean, it's like, get, you get a new shiny toy, I got a new story idea. It's awesome. But if it's, if it's going too long or you're not really making your point, you're wasting a lot of time, particularly those of us that want to make a living at this. So you have to really get serious and be able to you know, shave down some of that time and make it a little bit easier for yourself. And I think that's where people, I think, get a little either overwhelmed or they're, they're uncomfortable with it because I think we've thought of outlines as being formal, Roman numerals, you know, 
20-page beasts, you know, that we did in college, and that's not the case. You can make a really simple, basic visual outline, and I'm a huge fan of that because I think it helps authors see their story, and it really helps you, I think, have a lot more freedom to explore it. Right, and there, there are so many ways to outline as well. Like, I'm pretty amazed by it. I was just doing some research for another project of all the different ways, and uh, there's, you know, you can get as complex or as, as big as you want the outline, really. There are people that their outline is half the word count of their novel, which is kind of crazy, and then there's the people that each chapter is one sentence, which either way is fine. But one of the things that I've been seeing recently are that people are saying that it, it takes, you know, too much time to outline uh, but it seems like you save way more time than that when you get to the story because you don't run into those roadblocks. So, Because one of the things that you'll find is I, I outlined a whole story in two hours. That's all it took. And when I say two hours, that wasn't even two hours really doing the outline. That was two hours of actually setting the story up. So literally, I went in, did my visual outline with my mind mapping program, and then I went directly to, I used Scrivener. I went directly to Scrivener, pulled up my 3 by 5 cards, and then just, you know, I have multiple computer screen, so for those of us that on multiple screens, you might have to make these a little small to make it work. But I literally just put up my visual outline, had my Scrivener sitting there open with 3 by 5 cards up, and I just looked at each story point and wrote the chapter. I mean, just it was just, it's a paragraph, not even full sentences, of just this is what's going to happen in this chapter. And as a result, when I get into that chapter, I get to play a little bit, and maybe they end up at a different restaurant, or maybe they take a left instead of a right, it doesn't really matter, because I know that by the end of that chapter, I have to be set up for the next point. And so it, it gives you that ability to do that. It, it took me two hours to do that. So I literally have the book ready to go, and I was able the next day to jump right in and start writing. And that, to me, is a gift. And not only that, I don't have to write linearly. Let's say today I want to write a story, you know, a scene from the middle of the book. I can go right to that 3 by 5 card and start writing in the document. For those people who don't use Scrivener, it's awesome. You should check it out. But you could do this in Word documents. It doesn't really matter. Um, or you could use physical 3 by 5 cards. But being able to just pull that scene and go right in and start writing it, that's to me, that's freedom. I love it. So it, it sounds like yours, obviously, is a really visual way to do it. And yes. uh, Scrivener definitely is great. Um, before we knew about Scrivener, we were doing where each chapter was a different Word document. And that was a, a pain. So I did, too. That's what I did. <laughs> and it was a pain. <laughs> And uh, you mentioned that the uh, outlining program is on your site. Do you want to give, do you have a, like a quick link to that? For sure. Everyone? If you go um, if you go over to UpgradeYourStory.com and right in the middle of the page you can sign up for my newsletter. Um, I'm not even a monthly newsletter person. I'm about, an every, I'm about a quarterly newsletter person, but you'll get a link to download it. And I use, um, I set it up as a PDF. And then if you want to download the free, um, the free trial for Scapel, which is put out by the same folks that make Scrivener, it's a $15 product, but you can uh, download it for 30 days and try it out. But you can actually download the Scapel version of the, of the visual outline as well. But I, I just, it was funny, I just taught it in a workshop um, and it was, you know, anytime you talk to people about outlining, you can almost see their eyes start to glaze over. It's kind of funny. And you could just kind of, and the resistance was so clear, but they all paid for this class. They were there for a reason. And so we got started, and the, you could just tell their disbelief. They just didn't think they could do it. And they sat there, and they filled out the worksheet. And I had everything in paper format for them, because that was the environment. And it was just like the clouds cleared. You know, it was like, they're like, this really works. I'm like, yes, it really works. Like, you can actually figure out a lot of your story issues just by sitting down and laying it out. And it was, it was awesome to see them in less than a half hour be able to map out their entire story. It was really cool. Awesome. And so you mentioned Axe. So I know that's kind of even controversial as well. So do your, uh, does your outlining always follow a certain uh, three-act structure, five-act structure? What do you usually gravitate or stick so to? So the five-act structure and the three-act structure are actually the same structure. It's just about the way people lay it out in their heads. So the three-act structure is what we see in movies. Every 30 minutes in a movie, about you'll see a shift in the movie. So it might come at the 20 minute mark, the 25 minute mark, or the 30 minute mark, but it's gonna be about that mark. If it doesn't, most of us are leaving the theater or falling asleep. So it actually comes from screenwriting is the idea of a three act structure or even plays. Um, but the five act structure is actually the exact same thing. It's basically five beats and those are divided up into your three acts. So your first beat is usually your inciting incident, your second beat is the end of the first act, your um, third beat is usually middle of the second act, 
your fourth beat is the end of the, <laughs> end of the second act, and your fifth beat is usually that the, the conclusion and the denouement. So they all actually fit together. So I always tell people, if you're more comfortable with a five-act structure, just change my three-act structure into five, and you're going to have about the same thing. And I actually lay the beats out on... I do a visual representation, so you actually have the three-act structure, you have the, the five beats laid out for you, you have the plots on, on the one axis, and then at the bottom you have a timeline. So whatever you need to make it work for you, you can make it work. Um, but that... it they. And they're really the same thing. If, if, if you're hitting one of them, you're hitting both of them. And they're both designed to keep tension consistent. Because if there's one thing that we know in stories, whenever the story starts to lag is when we, especially now with Kindles, right, we can just flip to the home screen and go pick another story. So that's where, especially as genre writers and in the indie world, you cannot afford to not maintain your attention. And that's a really great way to maintain it is to use those, those structures. And it doesn't mean you're not going to surprise your audience. That's not, that's not the idea. People have expectations. They want to be, you know, entertained. They want the tension to be there. You can still do it in unique and entertaining ways, but you still have to meet audience expectation at the same time. She right. says on her soapbox, so I can get on a big soapbox on that one. <laughs> no, it, it's true. My wife and I were just talking about long ago about how um, everyone's so afraid of of having something that's similar to someone else's story. And I was like, well, look at all the stories that are basically the same. You know, the hero's journey that are all bestsellers, you know, um, that, mm -hmm. are, that are so similar, just with a different skin. So well, how does every might... romance end, right? Right. <laughs> they have to get together. If they don't, people get pissed, so. Yeah, even uh, we, we don't really write romance. Ours is more urban fantasy, and we ended a series, like, on a tragedy, and uh, we people were not happy, so <laughs> 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 definitely have to follow the, follow the norms for your genre, so. Um, all right, so just a little bit more, and then I'll pass you over to Lindsay. But I did want to ask, so outlining is one of the big ones. You can tell if someone's not outlined pretty much right away, um, or at least they, they don't have an idea of how the outlines for their genre should be. Um, is there another uh, big or common mistake that you see with authors that can definitely turn readers off if they do, don't fix? Probably not, not knowing your genre. So one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of authors are chasing trends. And there's nothing there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I mean, there's a reality here. This is a this is a the publishing world is a marketing world, and you know, we it, it's also numbers based. So as much as we can be warm fuzzy about our concepts and our art, at some point you have to acknowledge the fact that if your books aren't selling, the the books aren't selling. Um, but a lot of people are chasing trends, and then what'll happen is they don't really pay attention to what's working in those trends. So they think that because it's a romance, as long as I have a happily ever after, and they fall in love that that's good enough, and that's not the case. There's distinct tropes for every genre, and you have to be familiar with that. If you're writing mystery, you can't have it just be one antagonist the entire time with no red herrings. That's part of, of the structure of the story. So a lot of times what I'll see is people will think they'll have a thriller, and it's really dramatic fiction, or they'll think it's a romance, but one of the characters dies in the end. Well, that's not a romance anymore, okay? People get really cranky when you call that a romance and somebody dies in the end. That's like giving them, you know, a Disney cartoon and it doesn't end happily. That makes people cranky. So you have to you have to acknowledge that. So I do see a lot of times authors will be going after these trends. They'll either not know the tropes or they'll overdo them. So if you said your story in the Deep South, it doesn't mean every female name has to be two first names. You know, it doesn't mean you can't embrace the culture, but you don't need to be over the top with it either. There's there's a place at which you know you, you lose the respect for the culture and you're using it just as a device. And a lot of times I think we get stuck there. And there's also nothing wrong with reusing what's been already used. You know, yes, every romance has probably ever been written. I mean, there's plenty of them where people meet online, but it doesn't mean you can't use that for your story as long as you use your own voice and you use your own unique twist on it. And I think sometimes we're too worried about trying to make it really unique and then we make it a little bizarre. And that's always a little dangerous. Right, and I, I've noticed that a lot, and just like you said, I don't believe that it's a bad thing to chase uh, the trends or what's popular, especially in this where you can put things out faster than uh, traditional publishers. You have an advantage there. That's one of our advantages of self-publishing, but uh, I, like I told you before the show, uh, we, we get a lot of, of authors coming in with beta reads that are like, this is my first romance, and uh, it's you can you can tell, so <laughs> they, I don't read it. <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, read your uh, genre, because that really, it helps you it helps you understand what p 
people are looking for. It also helps you appreciate the emotional capacity that people are looking for. I think there's a big difference between writing, say, um, a sci-fi that's you know strictly adventure versus writing a sci-fi opera. And you need to understand the different emotional capacities that these characters need to have based on what the audience is going to expect. And if you don't give them that, that's where you're going to get the bad reviews. And I've watched it happen where authors have gotten taken down because they really didn't know what they were doing. And it's sad. It shouldn't be the case. And these, were, this is, these are good writers. These are not people who, you know, didn't have a good editor and didn't have a good proofer. I mean, these are good, good authors who literally got taken down because they just didn't know the genre. Right. And uh, I'll, I'll put in the show notes for people wondering or about uh, the different tropes. So reading your genre is, I mean, really important. Also, there, there are places online where you can look at movie and TV tropes of different genres, mm -hmm. and, I mean, those translate over to, to books very well. So if you're researching a new genre or something that you may like, or even your own genre, you can go there and, uh, and read those. I just interviewed someone who actually wrote them all in a book. Um, Kathy Yardley has a book. I have not read it yet, but I'm sure it's fabulous, and I'm going to try to think of it. I think it's called um, Painless marketing or painless book marketing or something like that. But if you go to Kathy Yardley's site, you'll find it. Um, but she actually just, and she said, I put every possible genre with every possible trip I could think of. So you can also check that out. That might be a good resource. Awesome. Yeah, I will uh, I will find it after the show and put it in the yes, show notes. Please cor anyone... uh, correct the title because I'm sure I screwed it up. I'm sorry, Kathy. <laughs> no worries. I'm, uh, I'll am i put it down there. So for anyone listening, you know, it, it's going to be below on the website. But if you're listening through iTunes or anything, writingpodcast.com slash 13 I'll have the show notes later with, with links to, to all this that we've talked about, as usual. So, uh, all right, last question about editing, and then I'll pass you over to Lindsay, who's going to ask you a bit about, uh, you know, marketing, author coaching, PR, stuff like that. So, last thing, um, we talked about some common mistakes uh, authors give you for their actual story structure and, uh, you know, pacing, things like that. Is there any more technical things that are often overlooked that you see? Um, you know, you always hear the, the different rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, spell check. Spell check is your friend. Um, technically, or like you mean like formatting issues or uh, you mean no, technical I meant, like, story issues? Um, one of the things that I think gets a lot of people in trouble is there's always the issue, particularly if you're writing larger stories or stories where you feel like it, they really benefit from more than one POV, is they forget that the minute that you add another POV, that character has to have an arc. So if you're going to have the dual POV set up where one character is in one POV and another character is in another POV, you have to make sure that both characters have an arc. It has to go somewhere. Because if the other character doesn't have an arc and they're just repeating what the previous character said, it gets, I like to call them dueling POVs. <laughs> because it's about now who can tell us the story better. Because it becomes really uninteresting. And so you have to remember that any time that you are going to set up a story and you're going to do the alternating POV, you have to make sure that the arc is complete and that there, there has to be somewhere that they're going and what their growth is. And a lot of times I think we miss that because we're just so hung up on, well, I have to tell this part of the story. There's a lot of ways to express story and still maintain one POV. The other thing I've noticed recently, and I'm not sure where this trend is coming from, but it's something I've seen more recently. I just have never seen this before, but I've seen a lot of sliding POVs where we slide from one character to the next. It's not a clear delineation. And the danger of that is that we don't necessarily know who's talking. So people will use pronouns and now they're very ambiguous because I'm not sure who's speaking. Or they'll refer to something and I'm suddenly like, well, wait a minute, I didn't. whose POV am I in here? And so that's also really dangerous. There's nothing wrong with doing it and it can be done really well. It's not currently the most popular way of writing, so I, I do kind of usually tell the people, you know, if you're going to do multiple POVs, I would at least do scene breaks you know, at the end, or, you know, give a very clear break that we're shifting POVs. Um, but slide POVs can be dangerous, and I, I have seen several of those recently, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, not thrilled with the execution. So, and I just think it's, it's a much harder way to write, I think. Right, awesome, good advice for sure. And your, your first comment about the, the point of views that seem to go nowhere, just immediately I think of, uh, you know, the Song of Ice and Fire series with... Um, Martin, where he has like 11 point of view characters, and you're following one, you really like them, and you're like, what's going to happen? And then they're dead. <laughs> Didn't go anywhere. Pointless. Yeah, and that's, and you know, on one hand, that was a device, and it's it was popular in the beginning, but it's part of the reason I stopped reading. Because if you're going to keep killing off characters that I was really getting into, well, then I don't need to keep reading it because I don't care about the other characters. You had me on these. Um, but for some people, that really worked. And for me, it worked the first time, but after that, it got to be old. 
So, you know, everybody's got their thing, and, you know, I, I'm one editor who says one thing, another editor can completely disagree with me, but there's basics about POV that you have to consider, and you have to consider the growth of the character, or they really don't need a POV. If you're going to bring us into their heads, there has to be a reason for it. If you're going to pull the gun, you have to shoot it. And uh, I think sometimes we, we forget that. We think we can just mention it. No, if you're going to pull it, you have to shoot it. It's just the way it works. Right. So, so George, when you're listening to this, because I know you listen to the show, so you listen to <laughs> Don't kill any more Starks. So that's all. Yes, leave them alive. Haven't they been through enough? <laughs> right. All right. So uh, that's that's it for me for now. I will pass you on to Lindsay, and uh, I will come back to you at the end of the show to ask anything that uh, that viewers want to know. So. Cool. All right. Testing out the internet here. I turned uh, turned the bandwidth down, so we're all nice and blobby. But hopefully we can hear <laughs> each other. I can hear you just fine. Okay, good. You're kind of blending into your pink wall now, but uh, that's cool. It's the red hair. No, the <laughs> that's it. Um, the first thing I kind of wanted to ask is just, I know you talked about that you do a lot of editing and helping authors in that capacity. Uh, you also on your site say that you're an author coach. What, what does that entail, and like, why would somebody be interested in checking that out? So primarily for people who have <laughs> particularly if you are someone who has not published before and you're really struggling getting a story done or if you're really having a hard time with the accountability end of things, um, a lot of us, this was interesting to me because I am not, I'm not an extrovert even though I, I can come across that way. I am an introvert but I've always been surrounded by an environment of writers and I'm not sure if that's because I didn't have a lot of friends so I just went out and found people to be friends with um, but I've always had that community and one of the things I've noticed the more I've gotten involved in the publishing world the more I've gotten involved with authors is how small their worlds are sometimes and I've met many people who write in a vacuum and the downside to that is there's no outlet for you to discuss and talk about things and when I was taking my MFA one of the gifts that they gave you as part of the program was you had a mentor. Now, don't misunderstand me. We paid for that mentor, but it truly was a gift in that it was someone who would talk for hours about my story. It was someone who was completely focused on my needs for that time and helped me work through really hard plot details that I could not do on my own. Could I have given enough time? Maybe, but I was really struggling with them, and so I really valued that. So that's the author coaching, is really kind of having that mentor there to kind of help you over the hurdles, get the book finished, keep you committed. Um, a good editing deadline can do that too, <laughs> as I have discovered, but it is really to help you get the book done, and done in such a way that you feel proud of it, that you, okay, I accomplished this, I feel like I got over the major hurdles, now when I get back into my rewrite, you know, I've, I've got a lot to work with. So that's the goal of author coaching. All right. It definitely sounds that that could be useful, especially for people who can afford it. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know. I, I actually get emails from a lot of people that are just looking for, like, will you do this for me? Basically, as far as you know, they've written their first novel, but now they're just they're really busy. And uh, <laughs> it sounds like you might be a nice compromise because <laughs> I'm not interested in doing anything for anybody. But so, and then uh, with the author. With the author PR, is that sort of like they're, they're complete, they're past that stage, and now they need help marketing it? Yes, yes. So PR I primarily do, um, right now I do mostly consulting, um, although I do, I do have a couple of uh, regular clients. Um, but yeah, it's really just kind of focusing on what is the next step. Most people struggle, I think, not necessarily with the execution, although that can be challenging, um, but generally we struggle with I don't know what to do. It's a big, bad world out there. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of people charging a lot of money not always with the best device. Sometimes you're not even charging that much, but it may not necessarily be very useful for you. Um, so what I usually try to do is dissect it and give it to people in digestible chunks. I talk really fast, so the good news is when you consult with me, you get a lot of information. <laughs> um, it's not a moment is wasted. Um, but I do try to help people boil that down. It's what's going to work for my genre, what seems to be working right now in the market. Obviously, that's something that I look at a lot uh, because I also do social media management for people, so I'm constantly looking at articles, news, anything that's coming out. I try to really keep up on it. So that way, when I do talk to people, I'm able to give them something that is current to current trends, what, what's working in marketing, and what's not going to work in marketing. Um, I think a lot of people, we do things that aren't necessarily very effective and people keep doing it because it's been tradition. Well, this is what you do. This is what everybody does. Well, so what? If it's not working and the numbers aren't showing it, what's your point? 
Um, there just comes a point at which you have to be able to say, you know what, that's not going to work for you. Or it might not work with your brand. Um, if you're super, super in introverted and you really don't want to do um, character interviews for blogs, well then don't offer those. You know, there's there's other things that you can do and understanding that is helpful. Someone might not be comfortable coming on a podcast and doing an interview, but could they do a written interview? And, and kind of shifting our thinking from I have to do this because everybody does it versus what's going to work best for you, your story, your brand, who you who you represent as an artist. So that's usually usually what most of my conversations revolve around. All right. Well, it's uh, it sounds like you do give a lot of great information and you speak quite quickly, so that's good if you're paying by the hour. <laughs> I, I was thinking I got to go back and listen to what you were talking to Adam about because you know all that is like stuff I know, but not always things I remember about a. Uh, you know, it's good to have it reemphasized, even if you do have a lot of novels out and you're you're you think you already know what you're doing. <laughs> oh, you can always learn. I always say I learn um, from so my clients. All right. Well, um. As far as like if you were giving advice to an author who just published their first book or they're about to publish it and they're like, how do I start selling copies? Do you have like maybe a top three things you would tell them that's actually working right now and that they would yes. should put their time into? So I, we all we all want to be the the unique story of the, the unicorn that sold immediately like E.L. James. And the sad news is very few of us are unicorns. Most of us are quarter, quarter horses. Um, very first book... To me, the focus is always going to be how many people can I get read this and review my book? Because you have to be able to show the world that one you're writing is worthwhile, that people are going to enjoy your story. Um, so usually I just recommend, you know, get as many people to read it as you can. Get them to review your book. Um, start working on building a newsletter. Uh, there's lots of there's lots of sites out there that will show you the basics of how to put together a newsletter setup, but, you know, you can do most things for free. Um, but as a general rule, your first book is going to be kind of the start of getting the ball rolling. And usually your second and third book <laughs> continue that trend. Um, and usually after the third or fourth book is where you see people actually start to gain a readership. So I was actually just, I just interviewed Jane Friedman. This is what we were talking about is that that first book is is your, your intro into the world. It's, it's your beginning swimmer's lesson. And it's getting you into the water, but you're not really noticeable yet. You don't quite have your backstroke down. But over time, as you write and as you put more books out, you'll start to see your readership grow. It doesn't mean that you have to write, you know, four books and publish them one right after the another. That's not the goal. But it is going to take a little bit of time to gain that readership. So usually what I recommend people do is get as many people to read it as possible, get early readers, have people review your book as much as possible, um, you know, contact some bloggers. It's a free way. You can send them an email, see, see what they say. There's lots of them out there. Um, start working on your newsletter, have people come to your site, can you give them something for signing up for your newsletter, maybe it's a short story, maybe it's um, some deleted scenes, maybe it's some, I don't know, something you've written that you're never going to put out and publish but it's good enough and people might enjoy it. Um, do something for free to get your newsletter started because that's the list that you own. Unlike Facebook which we've seen really fall apart over the last year for those of us that have put any effort in getting likes on our page, it's almost useless now unless you're willing to pay for advertising. So you're better off to own that list. So where Facebook took everything away from us and then we have to pay to use it, if you own an email list and people give you their emails, you now have a list where you can send out every time that you have uh, a book release or you have something special going on. Um, and I encourage people too to really work on getting people, if people like your book, so for example, when we first put out a book, you know, our friends and family read it and they tell us we're awesome. Great, that, that rocks. But now we want to get other people to read it too. So for every person that reads your book and if they really enjoy it and they really like it, ask them to be part of your street team. You know, ask them to be part. I usually do a little private Facebook group where people will get little teasers posted or little images or I'll post something fun there here and there just to kind of keep people involved, let them know what's going on in my world. And they tend to want to read your next book. So I have several already. I've put out one book and I already have several people who are like, send me everything. I'll read anything that you write. That's awesome. I mean, it kind of makes me feel like God, which is a very strange feeling. But it's also, it's wonderful because I have people I can give my work to and who will get the word out for me. And I can only do so much on social media as one person. But when you have a lot of people spreading your word, now you have a lot more power. So it's a little slow in the beginning. You're going to get started. And as that starts to build, hopefully you'll gain a readership. And we do see even books that aren't very well written. If people are consistent and they consistently put in the time and effort, this is a numbers game. And they will probably eventually gain a readership because someone somewhere will read it. Awesome. Very good advice there. And um, I always wonder about these people who have all these friends and family that 
actually bought like 50 copies of their books because I did not know that many people that actually read <laughs> epic fantasy slash steampunk. Even my parents didn't want my books. <laughs> I, I have had so many people who won't read my book because of the content. And that's why I had to laugh because I was, I was celebrating on Facebook because I'm finally over 30 reviews. And my husband was like, what's the big deal with 30 reviews? I'm like, because I didn't have very many friends and family read it to begin with, but now they really know it's beyond my friends and family. <laughs> So yes, more than more than my friends and family have read the book and liked it. Yay! It's uh, definitely a good point to get to. <laughs> Small steps. <laughs> exactly, it's every little step, but that's part of the process. Is just you you build, and that's your first book, and then the second book comes out, and it just kind of goes from there. And hopefully, if you're doing good work and you're consistently putting out a quality product, just as you've seen. I mean, you, how how many readers did you have when you started out versus now, and they're rabid for you. Yeah, and I've actually gotten my mom to read some of my books. So. <laughs> she's not she's not sure about the magic stuff, but <laughs> all right. But um, speaking of reviews, do you have any recommendations for people to get those first twenty, thirty reviews? And you know, because it's so hard to get any advertising or any loving out there at all. Even even the book blog, <laughs> book bloggers, I think, kind of lift their eyebrows at a book with no reviews. So um, any tips you know, for getting those? Yes. The So there's a couple things you can do that have been wildly effective for several of my clients. Um, one is, do you know anyone who owns a bookstore, runs book groups, um, has any access to readers who will be willing to go to bat for you? So for example, um, my best friend works in a government office and they share books around and they all read in the same genre and thankfully it's a sexy genre for me and so she said to them hey would you read my friend's book and they were like sure you know they get a free book out of the deal and they have been fantastic not only here's what was really cool about them they read eARCs which an eARC is generally generated before the book is proofed now in this case it was between proofers because I actually have my books proofed twice I'm an editor kind of a requirement <laughs> um, so it was actually between proofers so it was waiting to go to the second proofer and one of them caught two errors that the first proofer missed and it was one of those things where I was like oh thank God you know because they were people that knew me well enough to tell me so they weren't just gonna you know kinda of brush it under the rug and so that was incredibly incredibly valuable um, book bloggers tend to respond better one if you have a really super professional email if you add a picture a very small image of the cover and it better be a slamming cover it needs to look super professional and you know be really respectful in your email I've had a wonderful response from book bloggers even though it was my first book why because one I had an awesome cover and I was super respectful and I have told them look I appreciate it I want your honest review I am not you know I'm not looking for four star four or five star reviews I want you to be honest and really be respectful of their time understand that they get 70 to 100 or more requests a day um, and these are even some of the small book bloggers the big book bloggers get even more um, you probably you, you're probably not gonna get the big book bloggers the first time out but you can go after some of the small ones and they're super easy to find there's lists online you can go to Goodreads look at the books that are like yours who's reviewed them go to their <laughs> go to their profile page is their website listed check you can go and query them look for a review policy it's really not that hard to do and this is a numbers game so you're not just gonna send out 10 queries and get 10 answers you might send out 10 queries and get one answer so if let's say you want 30 reviews do the math you're probably gonna need to send out 200 to 300 requests and that sounds like a lot but if you've already started your marketing before you've launched your book so generally in publicity you generally want to start marking at least three months out so if you're in the process of just finishing up your book before it goes to editing you're in great time start querying those book bloggers or if you don't have time to do it hire a publicist to do it for you but that makes to me all the difference and we have had a wonderful response from book bloggers they've been super super awesome about getting back to us um, and it's really not that bad I think we make it into a monster and it really isn't but it does take work and it does take time and if you have a family and a job and all that other stuff it can get a little dicey all right and Adam mentioned that I guess there's a lot of people now who are book tubers who are uh, kind of blogging reviews on or vlogging reviews on YouTube <laughs> have you had any experience with that or is it worth you checking know, out <laughs> I think that's worth checking out but as a new author I don't know you'd have to see I have not had a lot of experience with querying them yet that's a lot of effort though and I don't I don't want to minimize that takes a lot of work a lot of the folks that do reviews on YouTube really put a lot of effort into it I've been amazed by how many people do uh, memes and stuff on Goodreads for the books they review when they really like them so they're really putting a lot of time into their review so I would say it never hurts to query um, if you're respectful and you're nice one of the things that I always tell people is never ever 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 respond negatively if they didn't like your book 
don't say anything. Um, if they responded back that, well, that's you know, this doesn't feel like it's it'd be something I'd want to read. Thank you so much for taking the time to read my email. Never, ever, ever respond negatively because even if they didn't respond this time, you can go back there later. So it never hurts to query. You know, it's like querying agents. It never hurts to send a letter out there. You might not get a response, but who knows? All right. You know, I actually early on had a a reader do a sing. He made up a song and then he sang it on YouTube. For, it was kind of a book <laughs> review slash overview of my, my first novel. I just was like so impressed <laughs> how much effort That's he went awesome. into that. But. Yeah, I mean, some people really do put in that effort, and you know, don't don't sneeze at it. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's, yeah, right, I, and, they're definitely out there. You can definitely find them, but it does take time, and it does take some effort, and it, can't, it can never hurt to send out. In fact, I remember a couple of years ago, I was a reviews editor for a magazine, and someone sent me, we did not take independently published books, like did not take them. And it was a very strict rule, and um, I was in charge of enforcing it. And at the time, I, I really felt that there was not enough in the indie publishing world that was of quality. Um, I've since had my... <clears throat> rear end handed me on that one, <laughs> but uh, I received a book that did not look self-published, it had a really nice cover, and he took a chance and sent it anyway, and um, I let it go through, and I actually reviewed the book. Um, it was one, I didn't do a lot of reviews myself, but this was one where I really liked the, the premise of it, and uh, I remember getting to the end of the book, and I'm like, oh my god, this is independently published, and it, was, it wasn't his first book, but it was his first nonfiction book, and I was like, I cannot believe I let this get through, but it was really good. And so you just never know, you know, and I, I, I mean, I've sung that phrases, his praises for many years now, so I love that book, that was fantastic. You just never know. All right, yes, you can fool everybody if you have a really good cover. Mm -hmm. Good cover <laughs> There's no typos way. in your blurb. <laughs> yes, yes, and proper comma placement, but yes. <laughs> All right, on your blog you mentioned that you do, um, Book launches and blog blitzes. Uh, what is a blog blitz, and is that something somebody could set up for themselves? Yes, technically. You know, really any of marketing you do yourself, probably the only real limitation most people have are graphics. So if graphics aren't your strong suit, um, there are actually some really decent sites to do some graphics, but if you want something that's really identified with your books, you probably are going to need to pay for graphics if you can't do them yourself. Um, but for a book launch or a, a book blitz, so the only real difference is I'm not a huge fan of blog tours, um, particularly the month-long blog tours. Um, it tends to be a little it's not enough to really do a whole lot over a month, particularly if you don't have a very big audience. It tends to be little dribs and drabs, so I always encourage people to condense that. So maybe do a blog blitz over three days, two days, a week, something like that. Um, and you find you're going to be, it's going to have a little bit more impact. You're going to see more things going around social media. When you do things like that, um, one of the things in our world that works really well, as we were talking about with outlining earlier, is to be visual. So you want to have graphics. Graphics make a huge difference in people sharing your message. Um, I manage blogs for some of my clients, and when we put a catchy graphic with their blog, it gets shared umpteen times more. I mean, we went from, I had one client, I just wanted to see what would happen, and this is back in the early days, and I just put up the blog post with the exact same copy, and a couple of weeks later I put up the blog post again, but I did it with a really great graphic, and it got shared 25 times within like an hour. That makes a huge difference, and so that's usually what we do with book launches and book blitzes is I do a full media kit, and that media kit includes graphics that are specific to your book, your work, and that hopefully represent your brand as an author. So they're very, very specific to you. And I think those make all the difference because if you have some classy graphics, I've been amazed how many people were like, your graphics were amazing and they were not fancy. I, I, I can do graphic arts, but I'm not particularly uber fancy with them, but I'm pretty good at them. Um, but they looked really nice and they look classy. And particularly since I write in sexy romance, it's very important to me to maintain that element of class because I'm also a businesswoman. Um, so it, they got a lot of shares as a result. So those are the things that I think make a huge difference when you're going to kind of get out there and get your book out there and put those packages together. You want to have that really, really nice, smooth graphic look. And I have seen, because I manage blogs for other people, I have seen some not-so-great-looking tour graphics come out, and I have been like, wow, what did someone pay for those? Because I wouldn't put them on the blogs that I manage, and I had to withdraw from the, the blog tours. So, ouch. <laughs> Yeah, I've been in some uh, author networking kind of promo things recently, and it's really nice when you, if you have like 10 or 15 people, you almost always seem to have somebody who's really good at the, the graphic stuff and can make these awesome banners. So <laughs> yes. It's definitely helpful. To, <laughs> I think that makes a big difference. Um, I'm kind of curious. Uh, you've been doing your 
<laughs> you've been doing your podcast for quite a while. Um, do you think this helped you at all selling books when you were ready to launch your fiction novel, or is it just kind of a completely different beast? You know, I don't know. Somebody asked me not too long ago. She said, "Well, how much business do you think you've gotten from your podcast?" And I actually have gotten some business, but that that wasn't that wasn't the goal of the podcast. I, it, in, a, in a roundabout way, it was. It was. A, it is a marketing piece. I don't want to deny its veracity as that, but that wasn't really the goal. I hate, with all capital letters, I hate networking. Um, I don't mind hanging out with a couple of people. I absolutely hate groups and crowds. So you couldn't get me to a networking event if my life depended on it. In fact, I'm going to some conventions this year, and I'm a little nervous about them because it's not my comfort zone. Um, but a podcast, I, it is literally the best networking event ever because I have been told several times that getting Lindsay Baroker on my podcast was a real coup. Well, how else would I have done that? It's not like you and I even live in the same area or write in the same genres. But I sent an email and you were like, sure, I'll do that. Well, I got to talk to someone who sells a lot of books and I got to pick your brain for an hour. That's a gift, you know, and I don't take that lightly. So to me, it's more the networking piece. Has it gotten me some business? Yes. If you're somebody that's passionate about doing a podcast and you've really been thinking about it and you really think that you have a lot of good ideas, I, it, it may not necessarily give you what you think it's going to give you, but it may give you something you totally never expected. And for me, it's been that networking piece that I just never anticipated. I have talked to some best-selling authors. I have talked to people who are, I mean, I just interviewed Jane Friedman. If you've been writing at all, you know who Jane Friedman is. That was that was huge. It was awesome to be able to talk to her and ask some questions. Um, so that, to me, is, is it, it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, I'm uh, the hardcore introvert, too. So it's, uh, it's an easier <laughs> way to maybe do the networking thing. It's not as intimidating is going to a con and like handing out cards and like, hey man, want to hook up? <laughs> yes. Um, I've definitely seen with podcasts in nonfiction kind of scenarios, I've seen people just really start a whole business based on finding an audience with a podcast. It does seem like it's, uh, because it is a lot more work than just say blogging, mm -hmm. that it's, uh, there's fewer of them out there in your niche. I'm not sure I've seen anybody really rock it with fiction yet, though. I, I guess if you were trying to maybe do, like if I was doing a, a steampunk podcast or something, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on fiction? You know, I think, so this is something I've actually been, been thinking about in large part, not necessarily for my podcast, but just in general, because I, I have a client who his book is just a pill to market, and we can't quite figure out why. But... I think part of it is sometimes I think we ignore the niches that are already there because I think we either think somebody's already doing it or it just doesn't occur to us. And in, in some cases, it just doesn't occur to us. But if you are, let's say you are someone who really gets into um, fan fiction or you really get into um, comic books or something like that where you have hardcore fans, you could do a podcast around that. Um, there are podcasts around just about any TV show you can imagine nowadays, and not just the official podcasts. There's, they're out there, and it's a great way to spread your word. So if you're writing, let's say you're writing, um, you know, f I don't know, fantasy fiction, well, guess where else we see a lot of fantasy exist? Hmm, the gaming world. Hmm, could there be a crossover here? Do you like gaming in any way, shape, or form? Do you have a history of that? Do you have a friend who does that you could share the podcast with? There's a way to kind of combine those worlds, and I think sometimes we miss those opportunities. I was just talking to someone the other day, and she was like, oh, that client that you have, that, that, because his book is just sitting there. We, we are doing everything. This one book, just we are just struggling to figure out how to get the right readers for it, because it is a unique book. Um, but she's like, oh, well, what about this thing over here? You didn't even think about talking to those fans, did you? And I was like, oh, my God. It didn't even occur to me, but it was talking to somebody else that gave me the idea. I wouldn't have come up with that on my own. Um, so I think if you really want to do that and you want to be successful, start thinking about where you can kind of cross platforms a little bit, not necessarily cross genres, because certain people will only stick with certain genres. You're not probably going to get a lot of mystery readers who are going to read sexy romance. There's some, but not a ton. Um, but you probably could cross promote, and what are those other people doing? So people that read fantasy or read sci-fi, do they play video games? Probably a lot of them do, not all, but there might be a really great crossover there. Um, same way with you know fans of anything, fans of Fly, Firefly or fans of Doctor Who or fans of Sherlock, where, what would they be reading? And can you make some type of connection? I think that might actually be more effective in the long run for marketing than just trying to make it, hey, strictly, we're just going to talk about fantasy fiction, in my never-to-be-humble opinion. Sounds like some good advice, and um, I'll be watching and see if anybody kind of 
you know, knocks it out of there with it. You know, especially with audiobooks becoming more popular, it seems like that would definitely be the same audience right there. So, well, yeah, it depends too, because some people that. will will listen to a book, but they wouldn't necessarily listen to a podcast. Um, I have a couple of friends who are like, "Do you have transcripts of your podcast?" Because I would never sit and listen to something like that. No, at this point, I can't afford to do transcripts. They're a little pricey. Um, but, you know, they're probably not the best audience for me either. But it is worth thinking about, would your audience do that? It depends. I got the dog trying to dig her way through <laughs> to China with her dog bed back here. It's always something. All right. Last uh, last question. Uh, you mentioned definitely having a newsletter uh, sign up for authors like on their web page. Is there any other stuff that you would recommend that an author really needs to have on, on her his or her web page? Um, if you're going to blog, it needs to be good and it needs to have a graphic. Um, there's a lot of great graphic generators out there if you do a little um, research. In fact, I need to do a blog post for this, but I think actually... Uh, maybe she didn't. I don't want to say that if she didn't. I need to do a blog post. I actually found some really nice meme generators, and they're not the crappy meme generators, but the really nice one where you can put a nice quote or something like that. But put a nice graphic with it if you're going to have a blog. If you know your book should be somewhere on there, I mean, I think that should be kind of a no-brainer. But one of the things I've noticed that, um, in fact, I just when I was interviewing Kathy Yardley, it was one of the things I said to her. Her website is phenomenal. Super easy to go and look at, and your eyes know where to go. And one of the things I've noticed with some author uh, blogs is they're messy. Um, it, it's almost like we're trying to shove our book out there so much that we forget that it's still supposed to be a platform. So rather than shove your book out front and center, if you're going to have a blog, have your blog there. You know, have your nice email sign up and everything else can be below the fold. Have a really nice navigation at the top. It doesn't need to be fancy. There's a lot of really great, if you do a Google search for simple author websites, you'll find some great kind of do-it-yourselfers um, that'll walk you through the process. But you want to keep it super simple and make sure that the eyes know where to go. I have off the charts adult ADHD. This is not in question. I now have an official diagnosis. If you send me to a website and I can't figure out where to look, I will immediately leave it. It's stressful for me. So and and I'm a very I'm a huge voracious reader. So you want you want me to enter website and to buy your book. So make sure that it's super easy if people know where to go. Because I think a lot of times we assume that people will look around and not necessarily. A lot of times people go, if they can't find what they need, something else will distract them, you know, their mate's going to call them for dinner, the kids are going to act up, whatever it is, and they're going to get distracted. So make sure that it's super, super clear. And you should always, always, always have your newsletter sign up above the fold, which is above the bottom of the screen. So if someone's on a mobile app or, or, or a mobile browser, they should, your sign up needs to be right there at the top of the page or somewhere on that page. There's lots of free widgets you can use, particularly, I, I tend towards WordPress, so there's lots of free widgets on WordPress that you can use for that. Um, Hello Bar is one of them. I can't remember the one, name of the one that I use, but there's some really good ones out there. But make sure that they can see that right away, so that way if they want to sign up for something and offer them a freebie, offer them something. It can be anything. If it's something you've written and it's good, make sure it's edited. Very key. <laughs> you know, make sure it's good. Don't give them something crappy or they're never going to buy your book. But you, know, you can put something up there and give them something, and you know what, they'll probably give you your email address. Um, there's a lot of things I would give my email address for if I feel like I'm going to get something good out of it. Um, Rachel Vincent will always, I will always remember her because she did a free novella, and her free novella is why I read. I can't even remember the name of the series right now. I was just several years ago, but she did a free novella, and I read the novella and I bought the next book. The novella was good. It was really enjoyable, great tension, and so I was like, I have to buy this next book. So don't don't discount that giving away that one free thing. It's not really giving it away for free. It's a marketing cost. All right, sounds uh, good advice, and I'm, I'm the last one to talk because I have the same uh, free blog <laughs> template that I had in 2010. As long as it's simple and easy to read, that's key. I will say at least my books are on the front page with links to the various sites. Uh, I don't know about other people, but it drives me crazy when I'm checking out an author's website because maybe they tweeted something. And what I really want is a link to their book on Amazon so I can download the sample. And I'm clicking, I'm like, clicking three layers deep on their site, and I never find it. And I'm like, I don't want to read the excerpt on your site. You know, I, I'm not going to read up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there should be a tab right next to uh, Home About Books. Just put it right there. Make it easy. Just Yeah, we were talking about affiliate links before the show briefly, and uh, that's one of my things. I make, for sure, the Amazon affiliate link. So one, so I can tell that people, if I'm actually making money, if people are clicking and buying my book through my website, but, uh, you know, also, it, it gets people right to Amazon right away, and I can make some money. <laughs> if they're still on my page, I'm not. Yep. I don't know. 
But um, I guess that's about all I'm going to ask. You've just had some really great information here. I'm going to hand you back to Adam to see if uh, he has any closing questions for you. <laughs> all right. So we had a couple of questions on the uh, sent to us on the website and elsewhere um, for you. It looks like two and then a couple of comments. So um, the first one, I guess these are kind of related. So the first one was um, why or how did you decide uh, to write romance? So coming from someone who... Uh, had been editing and, and uh, helping authors before they wrote the novel. Did you pick that for you know a specific strategy, or is that just what you wanted to write? Or? Well, there's there's <laughs> it's a short answer and a long answer to that. Um, the short answer is romance sells. So um, while I'm not I'm not one to necessarily chase trends. Romance is fun to write. It's real. I don't want to say it's easy to write because I think that's that's misleading. Maybe it's simple to write is the better word. Um, romance is a very straightforward expectations from the reader. You know exactly what they're looking for, so it's relatively easy to meet re reader expectation. If you enjoy the genre, if you don't enjoy the genre, then it would not be enjoyable to write. Um, the long answer to that is this: that book was actually a co-writing deal. That when they got the book, they decided to go in a different direction of the series and. They made that decision while I was writing the book and didn't tell me. So when I got it done and they submitted it, they were like, "Yeah, we changed your mind. We want to go. We want to go in a different direction." I was like, "Oh, okay." So now I had a finished book, and it's a good book. I really like it. Um, and I went to my husband and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I think I'm going to be publishing in the romance genre," which was never what I intended because I tend to actually I prefer paranormal and I tend to write uh, like paranormal mystery. That's my preference. Um, but it just kind of worked out that way, and I, it was funny, as soon as they turned down the book, I had the idea for a five-book series. So, and I knew exactly where the books were going to go, I knew who the characters were going to be, I knew what the storylines were going to be, and it, it just it came together that quickly. So that's actually why, how the whole thing came about. Did it work out to my favor? It did. Romance sells really well. It's very, very, very easy to get reviews for. Um, if you want a super simple genre, and if you like writing it, you can't get wrong with romance, because it's also a very, it's a highly consumable genre. So people read them, and they just want to get the next one. So as opposed to, I think, like literary novels where we read a literary novel and we just kind of want to like bask in it, we want to bathe in the words and we don't necessarily want to rush to the next one for fear that it's going to overlap the memory of that experience of reading, romance tends to be escapism. So just like for thrillers, sometimes we'll run to the next thriller. With romance, people tend to run to the next romance. So there's nothing wrong with that. They, they each have their, their goals and their uses. Right. And who, le who reads literary novels anymore, right? So. <laughs> I do on occasion. <laughs> Um, so, off that same topic, someone asked, um, let's see, let me pull it up. L.R. Dennis asked, um, who do you recommend authors who are wanting to get into romance read or research? So, for someone that maybe wants to, I've always wanted to write in romance but haven't before, where do you suggest they start? Just reading anything in the genre? or Read ones that are appealing to you. Look at what's selling. Um, I've always read romance. I'm trying. I mean, it's always just been part of my my mix of stuff. But I also used to be on the road all the time. I was um, I was a foreclosure inspector for a couple of years, and so I used to listen to books as though they were going out of style. So I mean, I've listened to all of James Patterson, not because I necessarily like James Patterson. But that's what the library had. So I've listened to a lot of uh, or uh, yeah, I've listened to a lot of romance. Um, I'm not a huge fan, but you know, Nora Roberts has a wonderful, wonderful, huge fan base. You know, look at what she's doing. Look at how these books are laid out. I'm not a huge fan of Nicholas Sparks, but his books sell. Why are they selling? Go figure that out. Um, YA is another one that if you get the beats, they have a lot of romance in them. So if you tend towards more YA characters, read some of the best-selling YA. What are they doing differently? What is what is appealing to people? The basics of the genre are relatively easy to lay out. So just for example, if you're going to write erotic romance, you know that really before you get to that 25% mark, not only should we have met our romance, our romantic uh, uh, main, main character or our romantic interest, we probably are going to have had at least the beginning of some sexy times. There's going to be a little something going on. That's almost a given. If you go too far past that 25% point, you risk losing your audience. That's just a given. How many sex scenes should you have? Well, the average erotic romance is going to have three to five or more. <laughs> Some of them have 12 and 15 uh, romantic scenes. So, and I'm using the euphemism romantic. Um, 
you need to be aware of that. They generally end happily. If you're going to do a cliffhanger ending, you're going to turn off some readers. There are some people that will still stick with it, particularly if it's a series and the next book's coming out quickly, but typically they want to see that happily ever after. But you can still write a series. You can then take spin-off characters out of that book and write other books in that series. That's what I did, because my characters end up together, because it's a happily ever after. I'm not giving anything away here. But I took other characters, and I'm going to write stories for them. So understanding that those are some of the expectations that people have and some of the best-selling series that we see tend to have those features. Think about would that fit what you want to write. It may not. You, you might be like, I this wouldn't interest me in the least. Then don't write it. There's, Look, <laughs> Lindsay writes fantasy. That would not have been the one I would say would be uber bestseller, and she does amazingly well. She's a huge fan base. So it, write what you love. You know, Go with a genre that really appeals to you. Um, but look at who's selling the best and read those books. Particularly, I really recommend that you read traditionally done books too and take a really close look at why it's working for people. Look at the comments. Look at the reviews. Why do people like them? What appeals to them? What are the things that are, are like what you want to do? Um, and you can even watch TV, you know, watch some of the, the hot romances that are on TV. What, what do people like about them? What, what emotional elements are really appealing to them? Because that's usually where people get trapped is the emotional elements. Is Are they getting that enough or are they doing too much? That's good advice for sure. And uh, so on that, something that you mentioned, uh, I think it's good to drill down to the subgenre that you're interested in too for sure because subgenres can have really varying um, yes, things depending. So, I mean, like even... I was looking over here at the questions. Um, even contemporary romance has so many subgenres that if you do, you know, end one in a way that that, that audience isn't used to, but it may work in another subgenre, uh, you could be looking at some some bad reviews and, and not. Yeah, so well. be cautious because I was amazed. I was doing some uh, keyword marketing research for a client, and we were doing. I was doing research for rock star romance, right? How far could you go with that? I thought that was really specific. No, there are actually search keywords on Amazon for things like Rockstar Romance and Lactation, Rockstar Romance with Pregnancy. Um, and it just went on, and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is crazy. So you want to make sure that you are hitting the genre that really, you know, are, are you an overview? Is this erotic? That's actually one of the things that romance writers need to really watch is, is your story erotic? Because I think a lot of people are either not wanting to call theirs erotic, and it is, or they're calling it erotic, and it's really not. And so that's another thing you want to look at is what are the accepted tropes currently because um, language changes in many ways when you move from romance to erotic romance. Huge, huge difference. You almost made Lindsay spit her drink out. She was in mid-drink <laughs> when you started talking about oh, rock star, lactation, romance, whatever. <laughs> hey, so. it was bizarre to me too. I was like, whoa I, don't, whoa, I just went to a land I did not anticipate. But these are the things that, you know, be aware of what's out there and, you know, know what works for your audience. Uh, nothing surprises me anymore gender-wise, though, after a couple months ago or whatever, seeing that big trend of, like, what was it, like, tamed by the triceratops and things like that. It's like, really? Yes, <laughs> yes, the, the yeah. dragon forced me lesbian. Yes, I, I remember that. That was awesome. <laughs> yes, we have we have a just a real quick funny story. We have a member of our writing group who will read all of these and review them for us just for laughs and giggles. And so we are forever sending her one. So the one that the, the, our favorite so far has been the um, taken by the HDMI cable. And what was the other one I saw? It was um, uh, romanced by the by Tetris or something. The game by the Tetris cubes. I was <laughs> just like, oh my gosh! But these things are out there, and people are making money on them. I mean, this is not um, <laughs> it's oh my, <laughs> know your genre, yeah. know your genre. Yeah. So one last comment on that, uh, not not to end of it, but <laughs> as far as knowing the genre is, uh, I did notice I was doing some research for something the other day. And um, there, are, so speaking of subgenres within like romance or with anything, especially romance, it seems though, because like you said, they want to happily ever after. Um, some of the genre or subgenres are more forgiving of that as far as like serialized or being serials. But I did notice that there are a lot of readers in some of the subgenres that if they see a book as book one of, they mm -hmm. won't even buy it because they know it's going to be a continuation of the same character. So mm -hmm. having them in the same world, but um, you know, it, it may be a consideration to think of if your uh, romance is going to sp span, 
yeah, multiple books. So. Well, and another thing to do, if you're going to do that, so for example, if you are going to have something that is going to be a multiple book series, because that is actually a question bloggers will ask, is they'll say, like, I only want to, you know, I only want to start this if I'm going to get the next book really soon, is you can put a teaser chapter, you know, and this is something we should be doing anyway, you should do a teaser chapter for the next book in the back of your book. And I'm amazed why people don't do that, particularly indie authors. They will not put a teaser chapter in. Put a teaser chapter in. It lets them know that it's coming. Give them an expectation. So nothing works for a writer's block like a deadline. Um, th this whole crap about, you know, I have writer's block, you don't when you have a date due. No, you do not. Let me just tell you, when Amazon's going to pull your pre-sale rights, you suddenly get past your writer's block. It's amazing how well it works. Um, so, you know, give them a date. Say, you know, this is going to be out, you know, June XYZ year. Um, you don't necessarily have to write a book every month, but you know certainly you should have it out within you know three to four months after the previous book. Um, if you're going to do something like that where you really have a cliffhanger, where you're not a, if you're not trad publishing and you're indie publishing, there is kind of an expectation for that to get resolved a little bit faster. Um, but on the other hand, if you do write it and it's just you just you just don't get it out in time, you know keep in contact with your audience and let them know what's going on. And I think they'll be relatively forgiving. Um, but a lot of a lot of book bloggers will only start a series if they know that the series is either done. Or that the series is being written quickly, and that was interesting to me because I didn't anticipate that. That was a that was something because I've I'm from a traditional publishing world. I had not I was not aware that was a thing, but it is. All right, all right. So we are right at the hour mark. So uh, just a couple comments from yeah, we, we did we did really well. We ended right where we were supposed to. So, um, but we'll wrap things up. And uh, before I get you to let everyone know where to uh, where to go to find you, I had a couple of comments from earlier when you were talking to Lindsay. Um, just really quick. So the podcast. Uh, podcasting things in your genre or blogging about it. I will say that one of the big mistakes that I've noticed sometimes is uh, if you're doing that, like you said, you you have picked up some clients from it, and you know people may pick up some readers uh, from it. But if you're doing it for that main reason, it's probably not. You know, there's probably better things you could do with your time, and you don't want to seem too salesy with your stuff. Yep. Um, like there are lots of communities where, like you said, there are crossover. Like a really popular one, which I've been thinking about getting into for a while is like the Reddit. There's things mm -hmm. on there for everything on Reddit. Um, but they're one of those that if you go on there and start, you know, promoting your stuff, you're not, you're not going to have a good time. So, um, And the other thing, uh, earlier you mentioned there are some places online where you can do some graphic work for free, you know, if you, if you have some skills but you don't have Photoshop or something. One that I use for just really simple blog post sometimes is uh, PicMonkey. I'm not sure if you've used that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's free and it's like it has all the or a lot of tools. There are some paid ones but so anyone that may want to go and play around with that for the next blog post or something. It's, uh, it's what I use just for the basic graphics for this podcast as well. So Yeah, and some people use Fiverr. I mean there's some other options out there definitely. Um, but just to the earlier comment, you're absolutely right. If you are there just to gain business, people will get that from it. And the funny thing is, it was never my goal for it. I don't even really know why I did the podcast outside of I like podcasting. And so, and it gave me an opportunity to talk to people. And I've always enjoyed that that piece of it because I'm not particularly outgoing in person. Um, but it's amazing to me how many people have come to me and said, I really, really like X, Y, Z about you. And how you know how much do you charge for your services? They didn't even look at my website. They just came to me because they liked me. And I think we 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 forget that if you are genuine and you are authentic, people will get that from you. Every time that will win over any type of marketing. And you just have to embrace that piece. And I think sometimes we just don't think we're good enough, but you are. So just go out there and do it. Have some fun. Yeah, for sure. And same thing for me, and it sounds like Lindsay too, we're all in it because of the, the networking is how I, why I got into it. I was like, you know what, I'd really like to talk to some more people in the, in the industry. How can I do that? Oh, I'll hop onto this uh, podcast trend. So. I'm here for the fame. <laughs> yeah, our, our current but especially with my internet viewers. delayed. <laughs> well, you're very famous to our five current live viewers. So, but, uh, so that was it for me. Um, I'll, we'll go ahead and close out the show before we keep here too long, but anything else you want to tell people or say to anyone, and also where should they go to find you and your books? Awesome. Um, you know what? Just know your audience and respect your reader because they want to read your stuff, but you have to find them first. So you can definitely do it, and it, it does happen, and but it does take time. So be patient because that's the toughest thing. Those people that stick in generally will win Will win in the end. Um, if you want to find out more about me, and if you'd like to down, I'm a huge fan of outlining stuff, so you can head over to my editing website to download the free visual out 
Outliner. It's super free, and I'm not a crazy spammer newsletter person, so really you can sign up and get it. It's relatively easy. Um, you can head over to UpgradeYourStory.com, and on the front page you can sign up for the newsletter. You can also head over to the blog. There's a sidebar sign up if that works easier for you, um, and you can download the outlining stuff. I'm a huge, huge fan of outlining, and I think it should be something that should be easy and make you feel better, not worse. My author website is AllieBishop.com, and you can head over there to find out more about my books. And I am a Twitter aficionado, so you are welcome to head over to my Twitter and bug me, because I love to be bugged on Twitter. It's one of my favorite platforms for social media, even more so than Facebook, although you can find me on Facebook. But definitely head over to Twitter. I'm at Upgrade Story and at Allie A. Bishop. Thanks so much, guys. All right, perfect. And for anyone that's listening and Let's do just click the links. Again, you can go see all the show notes, all these links at thewritingpodcast.com slash 13. So, Ali, it was fun having you on the show. I'm sure we may bug you to come back on. We were talking about before the show how uh, all, all these podcast guests and hosts are, like, incestual, though. <laughs> they go to all of them. So I'm sure we'll we'll be back around. So. Cool. Um, that's it. That's it for this week, everyone. We'll be back next Friday, as far as I'm aware, and uh, it'll probably be my turn to have bad internet then. So we'll see you then. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.